people are constantly raising the bar. Sacrifices need mm. to be made. What would you guys say are your biggest weaknesses? You or your enemy right now? It's success or die. Just a fucking podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Student Side Hustle. This week I'm speaking to Catherine Cross. So this is actually quite interesting. So Catherine was actually my lecturer, which I thought was quite interesting. And then basically in the middle of the, it was, it was one of the first lectures all semester where I was just enthralled because basically everything that was being talked about was everything that was in my ballpark. It was like calories in, calories out versus all that and then diabetes and all these sort of things that I just thought was absolutely fascinating. So I went up to talk to her in the break and it turned out she knew my previous guest as well. And then I was just like, holy crap, this is insane. And then effectively from there, I thought, okay, this person could be a great podcast guest. And they've got lots of, there's a few things where if you're from a traditional bodybuilding background, you might be like, whoa, what do you mean? Because it'll challenge a few beliefs, but I think there's no reason to not look into it. And it's not like, especially with a lot of keto people, I think a lot of bodybuilders write them off like instantly. And maybe some people in keto aren't the best, but there's a lot of good stuff behind it. And I think Catherine's one of the good examples of that because she's doing the research and actually in the trenches, she's not just Googling and then saying, yep, do keto. It's, it's a lot, there's a lot that's going into it. But Catherine, how did you start doing this sort of research? And when, when, did, you, when did you become a lecturer and what made you sort of think, I want to specialize in diabetes, um, low carbohydrate diets, and what sort of made you think that's where you wanted to head? Okay, well, I'm a pharmacist. I've been working in ordinary community practice for, um, well, when I started getting into research, I'd been in practice for about 10 years. And I was watching my patients coming in, um, being diagnosed with diabetes. We were putting them onto the, uh, the accepted diet at the time. We need to lose weight, so it's low fat, high fiber, low fat, lots of uh, exercise, and nothing worked. My patients were not mm. losing weight. Um, their diabetes was getting worse mm. and I'd be talking to them and I'm, and I'm going in my mind well either you're lying to yourself lying to me maybe lie is a slightly strong word but the the truth is being concealed somewhere mm. and if it's not then um, how much worse could it be if you were not on this doing this diet that you're that you're doing mm. I now apologize to all of those patients um, but it just seemed wrong that people were getting sicker and sicker at younger and younger ages mm. and for me to be telling them that they were going to be taking these medications for the rest of their lives mm. there had to be another way they, you know, the human beings were never like this you go back 50, 60 years they were not like this so mm. what's changed, what's gone wrong and then I got into triathlons uh, it was an entry level triathlon it was a 300 uh, meter swim, it was a 10k cycle, and it was a 3k run or walk. As long as you made forward momentum on two feet, they didn't care how fast or slow you went. And over 12 weeks, I joined this training group because I run like a square bowling ball. Um, not very fit, don't swim very well, I joined a training group. And over 12 weeks, with a like-minded group of women, it was a women-only triathlon, um, you could see the health changes in these women. Mm. It wasn't so much that they lost kilos, because a lot of them didn't, but they lost a few inches, their skin got brighter, their eyes got brighter, their mm. confidence in themselves. It was just a case of if they could keep this up, it was making big differences to their health. So I'd already done my postgraduate diploma in clinical pharmacy, mm. and at the time I wasn't interested in doing my masters. Um, but this was something I wanted to study. So for anybody out there who's thinking about doing postgraduate research, when you find the question that wakes you up in the middle of the night that you're going to answer with or without help, that's the time to do postgrad. If you're doing it for any other reason, think twice. <laughs> okay. Um, but I couldn't find a supervisor mm. for that initially. And it took me a couple of years until a, a friend said, Oh, you should go and talk to Grant Schofield at AUT. He does triathlons, he does research. He should be able to help you out. And Grant had me enrolled in my um, in the, the last paper I needed to do before I could be admitted to a master's program mm. about a week later. So, and that just got me into research, but sort of learning about what was going on. 
And my master's thesis was all about the importance of physical activity. Physical activity was way more important than diet. Mm. Diet didn't work. Was that for diabetes? or for No, this was just for overall health. Just general, yeah. Just general health. It, the title of my thesis is the attributes and intentions of female triathletes or participants in the tri, tri Women series. Right, right. Um, so it was all about how do we get women active? Mm. Do the triathlons get them active? Does it keep them active? Why are they doing it? It was for competition, the challenge mm. and the competition. That was the key driver of these women. And most of the women at the end, they were um, going to keep going, mm. not necessarily in a triathlon. Some of them decided running was more for them. Others were keeping into swimming. Others were, though, going on to doing round telpo. I went on and did um, Coast to Coast with my husband. Mm. So from f- four years previously... I couldn't run for five minutes Mm. to, okay, it wasn't pretty, it was a long time, but I did coast with my husband and I did the run over Goat Pass. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what these events were doing. They were stimulating, they were getting it going. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to keep the the research going. Grant was quite keen to keep me going. But one of the things that I found though with the research was that uh, my women were not making 30 minutes a day on five or more days of the week. They were not meeting... New Zealand physical activity guidelines. Yeah. But they were weekend warriors. They were racking up the minutes mm. in two or three days. Right, right. Right. So, so it's case was, would it was it would, would you say it would be say of overall goal is what's thirty times five? But hundred and fifty minutes 150 a week. Hundred and fifty minutes a week. Would you say they'd try and get that in the weekend or nearly? They were doing that over two or three days. Right, they were right. not doing it in, but New Zealand physical activity guidelines means you should be meeting 30 minutes or more a day right. on five or more days of the week. Right. They weren't getting the five or more days, yep. but what they were doing was really impressive. Mm. So, you know, their fitness was high. So that was me trying, I now wanted to learn more about cardiorespiratory fitness, right. how that was gained and its relationship to metabolic disease. Because right. as a pharmacist, my goal is to get people off the pills. Mm. That was what I was trying to do at university, get people off the pills. How do we use the least amount of medication, the least potent, and mm. maximise lifestyle. Mm. And at the same time, Grant was getting into, um, you know, still Grant Schofield, he was getting into low-carb diets. Yeah. I was classically trained, medically trained, low-carb diets were bad. Right. So we had a number of um, robust academic debates. <laughs> there were some humblingers. We were fairly robust at times. But I couldn't refute, my physiology was out of date. Right. Couldn't refute what he was saying because I wasn't up to date. So he said, give me that book, I'm going to go and read it, and I will refute it. Right. I spent the next three months going through the references because it made too much logical sense. Right. That book was The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Living by Steve Steve Finney and Jeff Folek. Folek and Finney was the author. Right. And for anybody wanting to learn more about any of what we discuss, I would say Mm. that is the place to start. Mm. If you've got some basic physiology, basic biochemistry, start reading the book. And if you don't have the basics, you will have by the time you've read the book. And if you want to argue with any of their references, it's all there at the full in-depth bibliography at the back of the book. You can go and argue with it. I spent three months doing that and couldn't. (laughs) So that got me into insulin resistance. Right. Insulin resistance is the uh, forerunner of type 2 diabetes and many metabolic diseases like mm. cardiovascular disease. Mm. Would you say if, if overall high insulin resistance would be a really overall, you, you, you want to reduce that as much as possible in everyone? In everyone. Yeah. And your classic person who will be insulin resistant is um, somebody who's got a large waist to height ratio no they've got right. a belly on them yeah right um their blood pressure is slightly higher than desirable or a lot higher than desirable yeah. their blood glucose is higher than desirable right or they're taking medications to lower those mm. their triglyceride levels are high and their hdl cholesterol levels are low if you've got three of those five symptoms you have insulin resistance right, right. my challenge was that i couldn't work out what the pathophysiology, how it worked at the uh, cellular level for mm. insulin resistance to translate into disease states. Right, right. Until there was a paper sort of throughout compensatory hyperinsulinemia. Right. And I'm going, okay, 
I have no idea what hyperinsulinemia, apart from the fact that I can translate the Latin to high insulin levels. Yeah. We, when we're treating diabetes, it's a case of, it's, it's damn the torpedoes and steam ahead. We've got to get your glucose down at all costs. That's right. conventional thinking. Mm. To get your glucose down, how much insulin do we need to pour into people? Yes. And my you feel like it's like you're 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 fighting the battle with the wrong weapon, sort of thing. Like it's just you're just you're, you're just trying to beat down a wall, but using like a rubber hammer. So it's like. Well, it's um, you're 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 treating a symptom, mm. but at the same time, when you're treating the symptom, you're fanning the flame and making it worse. Right. So by only treating the symptoms and not treating the root cause, you're actually not going to solve the problem. Yes. And in this particular case. When you put high amounts of insulin in, you can make insulin resistance worse. Right, right. So you're you're feeding the flames, trying to treat it. You might give yes. the glucose down. Does it work? That's though? actually not the problem. Yeah. Okay, so we, we know we so we so for me it was to go back to first principles, work at what the root problem was, and then start building up from there. So every mm. time I'm sort of going through something, I'm trying to get people back to, or the question I'm sort of going back to is what's the fundamental physiology, biochemistry, hormonal principles mm. that underline all of this, right. and I'll build up from there. Right. So that's what my thesis ended up being. Cardiorespiratory fitness went out the window, and it's a case of, we actually, you know, we talk about finding your gap in the literature. Mm. I joke about the fact I didn't find a gap, I fell into a big black hole, it's a chasm, because right. there wasn't much being done. So yeah. I've, I've quite proud of the fact that I've helped to mm. really build up a lot of the research from fundamentals mm. um, around the world. It's now, it's, it's amazing how it's taking off. Mm. And do you, so w with this, there's a few, there's a few things that I have written down that I'd like to cover. So overall, um, what would you say, I think we covered on it briefly, but what, the, would you say the main reason that you think this is so important is to treat things like diabetes, um, general metabolic issues would you say that's the main reason that people should be adjusting their diet to a lower carbohydrate approach or do you think well no I'm, I'm going to say I'm, I'm actually I, I'm now describing myself as a food agnostic right there are multiple ways through diet you can achieve this right. and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach right so whatever dietary approach that somebody chooses to take Right. That's going to achieve good hormonal balance, mm. good biochemical rhythms, and good overall body homeostasis. Right. Go for it. What, what would be some either recommendations, but then also how can someone tell if they're heading in the right direction? For example, we use myself as an, as an example. I would consider myself a bodybuilder. Yes. I lift like five, six times a week, mm -hmm. relatively low body fat percentage compared to the normal population. Yes. Um, high muscle mass compared to the normal population. Do a lot of exercise, but then you got to consider what I eat. Well, the first question I would actually ask you at this point is, if you missed a meal, mm. would it be the end of the world? Depends. So, for instance, I, I might be a unique case because I have just gained weight my whole life. I've never gone through a cutting phase. I've never tried to lose weight deliberately. Just because I started off so small. Well, no. When I say by the end of the world, um, there's there's a, a new word that's come out in the last few, uh, three or four years that I've started hearing. It's the term hangry. It describes right, no, it somebody not, gets no. really really bad mood changes, right. especially down the grumpy irritableness. Right. And it's solved by eating. Right. These people will um, have breakfast, need a morning tea, mm. have lunch need an afternoon tea, have mm. dinner, and there might be other snacks going on in, bet in between. Yeah. No, what, what I mean is, you know, my first question is trying to work out if somebody's on the right track or right, not, right. is if you went six to eight hours without eating... Would you be fine? Would you be fine? Yeah. And would you, right. not, not just, okay, I'm hanging in there by the skin of my <laughs> teeth, but would you be able to hold down a high level sensible conversation? Yes, would you yes. be able to carry out your normal day job? Yes. That is the first question I would be asking right. somebody to go. So that's a good indicator. That's actually a very right, good right, indicator. Right, right. Because when your 
hormones are out of whack, cortisol, insulin being the main two, right. it's, they get high and it's very difficult then for the body to start burning fat. Fat is actually one of your main fuels. Hmm. So you've got enough glucose and glycogen in storage to last three to four hours, right. depending on your physical activity levels. Yeah. Right. So if you've got somebody who's fairly sedentary, but has to eat at least every four hours, or whereas they get really grumpy and grotty, and right, right, or right. maybe they get over talkative, it's a case of they've, they've suddenly run out of glycogen. Right. So that's the, the issue. But they is can't they're burn not, fat. They're not doing. They're not being able to convert fat easily enough, or they not. They cannot it's burn an fat. Issue there. Yeah, there's a right. big issue there. People for whom it's happening a lot more often than that, they're not burning fat. So would you say, for someone in that situation? And this is, I think, something that... Um, well, you've got to start taking a good, cold, hard look at what you're eating. Right. And get ruthless with keeping a food diary. So if we're talking... So adjustments from there, would you say... Obviously, add exercise. That's obviously great. No, the first thing I'm actually going to say is to cut the crap. Now, when I say by crap, I mean carbonated, refined, yep. additives, and processed. Yep. Because all right, it comes back to... Okay, sorry if I'm about to start heading down the science tangent. It comes down to a leptin called a hormone called leptin. Right. Right. Now, leptin is produced in fat tissue in the periphery, outside of the brain. Right. But when it reaches the brain stem, it says um, you've eaten enough. Right. You can stop eating. So it's an appetite controller. But it doesn't just control appetite. It also controls um, energy expenditure. Now, energy can be divided into two main groups, necessary energy and um, play. Energy right, yeah. that's energy expenditure that's not necessary for survival. Right. I term all of that essentially under So that would play. be, for example, I'm not sure if I'm using the right term here, neat. Um, neat. Well, it's it's yeah. not just neat. Neat is non, yeah. uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Right, yeah. So housework would come under yeah. neat. Yeah. Um, but uh, going for a run or playing a game of touch or ultimate yep. frisbee or anything else yep. depends on your definition as whether you're going to call it exercise or not. Right, right. So okay. exercise is a planned physical activity session. Right. So it's just general calories you must burn to stay alive versus overall calories you do doing anything, opening doing the anything. window. But, but, but opening the window, some people will put that down to survival. Right, right. Okay. Right, so, when I, so, it, so housework might be survival right right okay so it, it but but play is um i want to go and do this it's fun right it's it's you don't okay. necessarily you know it's going for a run because i want to go for a run it's running around the garden with the dog because it's fun we're, 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 it's fun we're, we're playing yes. not just taking the dog for a walk because i have to take the dog for a walk yes. all right that would come under almost survival so sometimes when we're thinking about what's happening we have to take ourselves back, humans back about a thousand years mm. and go back into um, pre-industrial times and look at survival and what's happening within the hormones there. Right. So going back to leptin, leptin's a thing that produced in the periphery in your fat tissues but must reach the brain to say, I've eaten enough, I can start playing now. I right. can burn calories in non-survival, non-necessary activity, right? Because I don't need these calories to survive. So if leptin is low, effectively, you'll be less likely to, well, theoretically, you'll be less likely to go and say, oh, yeah, you know, what, I'm going to go take the dog for a walk because I want to. Yeah, or, absolutely. Right, and you, right. and you'll you'll take the dog for the minimal walk possible. Right. And you'll come back absolutely starving, needing to eat something. Right. Right. Right, so when leptin is low, and I'm going to make the corollary on that one, when it's leptin is low in a certain part of the brain, and we'll come back to that one in a second, if your leptin is low, you're going to be hungry, and you're going to want to hunker down and conserve energy, i.e. sit on the couch, watch Netflix, and probably eat something that's high energy density. Right, right. Right, you know, the brain's going, we're starving here, you've got to eat, you've got to conserve energy. Right. Right, insulin prevents leptin from reaching the brain Ooh. wow so and then that would that be how it plays in so then effectively if you're if you have so much insulin because you're so insulin resistant 
then effectively you're going to have lower levels of leptin in, reaching in, in, in the, the brain. In the brain. And then but you are actually, when you measure the leptin, it's still tons. It's tons. Right. You're leptin resistant and insulin resistant, but the two right. feed in together. Leptin's not reaching the brain. So if you want the, you want your, so somebody who's insulin high insulin, mm. leptin not reaching the brain, they go. I need to lose weight, get more activity. Right. I'm going to start by forcing myself to go for a run. So the right, okay. The brain's going. We don't have enough calories here. So then it feels horrible. It feels horrible. It right. is hard work. So and you come out of it starving and completely exhausted. Would you say that approach or that primary hormone profile, or I'm not sure what you call it, that um, general idea or um, thing? would basically be the reason why people can't adhere to their diets or whatever, 95% or whatever the amount is? Well, we'll, we'll come back to diet in a second, but yeah. it's one of the biggest reasons why people who are insulin resistant struggle with a lot of exercise programs. Right, okay, yeah. Okay, now these might be, um, and surprisingly enough, we have found some high level athletes who've actually got high insulin with some of the testings that we've done. And right. it's a case of, but when they're eating it's very very high carb and it's very very frequent it's all healthy carbs mm. but it's not necessarily solving the problem right these people still get hangry yes if they haven't eaten for a few hours right right so the first thing to do when you've got somebody like that it's a case of don't put them on the treadmill take away the processed food out of the diet mm. take away the highly refined carbohydrates take right. away the sugar now, it's not going to be easy for these people because they know that half the time, sugar is the thing that's going to mean they can solve their hangry problem and right. can function. So is that... So, you, so you've got a massive... You've got layers upon layers of things that have to be broken. Right. But you take away... You start with diet. Right. All right, because a lot of what we're trying to control here is hormones. And it's much easier to start controlling your hormones with diet than it is with exercise. So you take away the crap, the carbonated, the refined, the additives, the processed. Yeah. You take away the sugar. You take away the white flour. And when we when we say take away, do we mean cold turkey? What do you what do you see as being the best? Different approach or? different approaches work for different people. Yep. I had to go cold turkey. Yeah. Wasn't going to happen in any other way. Right. And I also did it cold turkey as part of one of my uh, PhD peers research programs. Mm. Every time I looked at something that I had a sugar addiction and I was absolutely craving for it, right. I would look at it, pick it up, but sometimes it wasn't really a case of pick it up, and I had to say, you cannot screw up this research program, put it back down again. Right. I was probably extremely unreasonable to live with for a couple of weeks. Right. Very patient husband, he did the same, <laughs> re he did the same research study with me, so we're both going through the same diet together. Right. Because I don't know if I could have coped if he was still living a high carb diet, yes, starches are addictive as well. Right, rice, pasta, potatoes—they can be very addictive. Would would you, would you say that? Because I think a lot of people, especially in my community, like I'm not sure if you know Lane Norton. He's a he's sort of um, no, no. He, do you know Dom Diagostino? I do you, I've, 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 have I met him? He's a, I, I know the name, and so, I may possibly have met him. And I'm right, definitely in the same Facebook. Yeah, same category. Yeah, yeah. So. Dom's more like sort of low carb, and then Lane is basically pure bodybuilder, calories in, calories out, um, carbs, 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 etc. If, if you want to simplify I'm, I'm, that. I'm going back to what is your hormone profile? Mm -hmm. What is it you're trying to achieve? Now, there's people out there at opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm. If you're somebody who's very insulin sensitive, you're not going to have an issue, mm -hmm. especially if you stick to more sensible carbs. Mm rather than all of these high glucose things um you know, there's i've got issues around those because right. they will change your hormone profile right. maybe you'll bounce back very quickly and maybe right. you can bounce back very quickly in your 20s but when you get to your 30s maybe yes. things change yeah. so for example let's use me as an example on a on a very a day that would be a good example for example wake up have two bowls of cereal some fruit Lo obviously lots of carbs now yes but when you were talking about cereal are we talking yeah. about rice bubbles so. well nutri is not much better than rice bubbles yeah, exactly. or muesli you know there's yes. a difference between so high sugar cereal 
and then we're having. It, it's a highly. Re- do you know? Do you know where the um um. Are you, about, are you about to ruin New Chicago? I'm probably about to ruin <laughs> most. I'm about to ruin cornflakes. But do you know why there was a big movement to um to, for, for breakfast cereals like this? I have no clue. Okay, sanitarium Kellogg's. Uh, when you go back and look at the, the founding behind that, it was highly religious. Some of them are seventh, a sanitarium is very Seventh Day Adventist. I think it was Kellogg's who was going, you know, most of our uh, young men have got too much red blood in them. This will be an <laughs> anti masturbation aid if we get them onto these cereals. Is there any logic behind that? I have no idea about the logic behind that. He was trying to sell us grain products, but it was a case of, no, we cannot have masturbation. So we'll get people eating these cereals. cereals. Right. You can Google that. So Yes. That's where a lot of breakfast cereals have come around. You know, got to cool the blood down. And then when the low-fat diet movement really came through, it moved people away from the bacon and egg breakfast, the cooked, the cooked yeah. breakfast, too high in fat. So right. the cereals were already there. We'll move people onto these oh, low okay. fat so cereals. So it was like everyone started to demonize fat. And then, because my thing is, I'm I'm myself trying to find the balance between, because everyone in bodybuilding, I think it's way more carb centric. Everyone's like, love carbs, love carbs, etc. And it's it, obviously you can't simplify it down to that. Yes, but one of the good things about well. carbs for bodybuilders is insulin is an anabolic hormone mm, mm. so if you're trying to build muscle mm. you want protein growth as much as possible so yeah. you want to be spiking your insulin it's yeah. the easiest way of spiking insulin yeah. grains and carbs mm. uh, like I, ideally of... lower glycemic carbs to keep right. your health and would balance. you say so for, would we, but how do we fatten pigs and cattle we feed them grain yes how do we fatten ducks we mm. feed them grain mm. so it depends on the circumstances for which you are in as mm. to whether this is a good thing or not. So, say for someone like myself, a relatively high carb diet, I would say the only fat I would get in would be from olive oil and peanut butter and you know high, high fat sources. And then, apart from that, the majority of my meals would be very, very high carb, very, very high protein. Um, but also, when I check my blood glucose, but this is just, you might have a... So when I check my blood glucose, it's normally in the normal range, usually about 4.3 to 5.3, somewhere, somewhere around there, usually a lot of the time. Um, one time it was seven, but I just had a can of condensed milk and a McDonald's chocolate shake, like, yeah, I know, I know. And how quickly had you tested your blood sugar after that? That would be an hour after. Uh, and there's, if you didn't wash your hands properly. Oh yeah, yeah I made sure to do it. You, the alcohol swabs don't work. Oh no, no, fully soap Yeah, okay, fully soap and water, right. I mean, just water's usually just fine. But okay, so that's actually one of the things that people often overlook. And they have a trace of orange juice or something on their <laughs> fingers. And they'll spike a high glucose level. And it's a case of, it's got nothing to do with the glucose in their blood. It's got everything <laughs> to do with the glucose on their finger. Yes. Yeah, the test strip doesn't differentiate. So then that ruins everything. But the question is, though, is what's happening to your insulin behind the scenes? Mm, it's going super high and then We don't know back. what's happening. Right. Right. Insulin levels can go up 10 to 20 years, blood glucose levels change. Would you be able to re- rephrase or explain? Right. So, um, insulin resistance, right? So, when somebody is insulin resistant, and they eat carbohydrates, they get a much higher insulin response for much longer mm. than somebody who's insulin sensitive eating the same amount of carbohydrates. Right, okay. But the role of insulin, one of the roles of insulin, is to keep blood glucose levels in that very narrow window mm. of you know, 3.5 to 5.3 as the, one of the standard reference intervals. It changes depending on which book you read. Mm. So your insulin might be very, very high in background controlling your blood glucose levels. Right. But you don't know this because you're not... So you can't measure not, that. The, it's very difficult yeah. to measure insulin. I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. That is actually what my research is. I will be putting out a call for research subjects, hopefully in the new year, um, as soon as some test strips arrive, to do one of these studies. Um, so we don't know what your insulin's doing in background. Mm. To keep, but it to keep your glucose low. Right. What we do know is insulin resistance goes up, and it may go up up to twenty years before we start seeing changes in your blood glucose levels. Right. Your insulin's going up in the background. Right. When your insulin is high, you will find it very hard to burn fat. You might find it easier to put on muscle. 
you'll find it much easier to put on fat. But it's doing all of these other things in background, um, it increases inflammation. So it's mm. going to be easier to injure yourself and harder to heal from it. Mm. It can clog all your little capillaries, mm. which again, if you cut yourself, uh, it makes it harder to heal. Um, but in uh, what we're also finding though, is it's increasing the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease and other dementias later in life. Right. So glucose might be great, everything else might be going great, but we mm. don't know what's happening to your insulin. And we don't know how much insulin too high for too long is going to increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease in your 60s and 70s. Right, so I think one thing that, when you said, I was like, when, when you said the first time in your lecture, it sort of blew my mind a little bit, and it was a bit scary for me. Um, for instance, the, the, say if I eat like extremely high carb carbohydrate now, do you say, or do you think that may possibly set me up for diabetes or Alzheimer's in 20 years from now? Possibly. I can't, we don't have the facts. Right, right. I yeah. haven't measured you. Yeah, yeah. For some people, absolutely, it will absolutely increase the risk. Right. For other people, it may not. Right, so it's a, This is, this it's is the big black hole of research that I mentioned. Right, okay. We don't have enough longitudinal data to you say the best bet would that. be to... Because I think in general, it's a pretty good idea to stay away from things like sugar for as much as... as I would be saying at this point in time, stay away from heavily processed food. Right. And foods that contain excessive amounts mm. of high GI... You know, if, if your glycemic load is going to be high, yep. maybe that's a bad idea. I was at a <laughs> conference in June. And uh, at this conference in June, and one of the things that was an agreement with amongst the people who are low fat researchers mm. and low carb researchers is everybody should be adopting a low glycemic load diet. Now that you is a combination. That. Now do you understand the concept of the glycemic index? Yeah. Right, so foods so like example, sugar has got a very high yeah. glycemic index. So then insulin will be spiked much higher. Insulin will be spiked much higher. Yeah. Um, other foods um, compared to sugar. I mean, compared to sugar, fruit. they've got a very uh, not in fruit. A lot of fruits got very it's fiber. You know, uh, cabbage. Lower. Cabbage, okay. Cabbage has got a very low glycemic index. Right. It's very hard to get a useful carbohydrate out of the food. Right. Right. So if you ate a hundred grams of sugar, right, or hundred grams of glucose. Yeah you would have, be able to absorb pretty well all of that 100 grams of glucose yep. into your bloodstream. Yep. But if you ate 100 grams of cabbage, yeah. all right, although cabbage is a carbohydrate. Do you mean 100 grams of, or whatever, how much cabbage is 100 grams of carbs? No, this is where we move, start moving into glycemic load. Right. So glycemic index is, hopefully I've got this right, you may need to double check me on, on my facts. But carbo glycemic index is, um, if you ate a hundred grams of a carbohydrate containing food, yes. how much is how much change do you get in your blood glucose profile? Right. Right, okay, right. so glucose, you're gonna get a big spike in your glycemic, in your, you know, in your blood glucose levels afterwards, you'll see a big change. Yep. Cabbage, you eat a hundred grams of cabbage, it's gonna make minimal change to your blood glucose levels. Would, would one thing I'd like to point out is, how big would so this is just me trying to understand glycemic load right. if, if, glycemic load is the next stage so wait, so, wait, wait, wait. If, 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 if the amount the table is both 100 grams of carbohydrates would the overall load be the same but the free, the time that you consume the load is different right no you're, you're still conflating index with load right, okay. right so you've, you've taken the next step and you've already jumped to load mm -hmm. but index is how if we gave you a hundred grams of that food, yeah, yeah. what will it change your How blood glucose it levels? Right, right. right, glycemic load is a good way of explaining it is watermelon. Yeah. Right. It's actually got quite a high glycemic index. I yeah. think I've got myself mixed up. But but if you ate watermelon, it's very hard to get a hundred grams of viable carbohydrate yep. out of watermelon. Yep. You've got to eat so much watermelon. Because there's just so much other stuff in there. Because there's so much, so if you were to get 100 grams of carbohydrate right. out of watermelon, 
you probably eat a kg or two. You might be eating a kilo of watermelon. Yes, yes. So watermelon is a low glycemic load Right, food. but then say you have 100 grams of glucose, it's probably 100 grams of carbs. It's 100 grams of carbs. Yep. So glucose is still high glycemic load right. because it's high glycemic index mm. combined with how much of this do you have to eat to get that amount of carbohydrates. Okay, yeah. So potatoes, depending on how you cook them, they can have a relatively high glycemic index, but they may or may not have a high glycemic load. You cook your potato, cool it, you get resistant starches, and it changes It changes the, your blood glucose profile. Right, right, right. It changes the amount of viable carbohydrate you get out of this. So then, how, how would the, the, pe- the person that we're trying to apply this sort of... Oh, it gets more complicated than okay, that. Okay. okay, so you can find glycemic load tables on the, on the internet. So you can sort of figure out... You can figure out. Would you say you generally want to keep it as low as you can? You want to keep your glycemic load low. Yes, right. absolutely. That yep. was one thing that came out of the Swiss conference, yep. was um, glycemic load mm. should be kept low. Would that so be- you can still eat all the... Car- you know, For people who are a fan of eating high carbohydrates, right. fine. Do that yep. out of low glycemic load foods. Right, okay. So you might be having to eat a lot more bulk yeah. to get the same amount of carbohydrates. It's not going to be as easy right. to get the same amount of carbohydrate. Right. You're not going to be spiking your insulin and you'll be causing, evening out some of the load. So it'll be, body. would you say that over, uh, decreasing your overall load would say in 20 years make you less likely to? Yeah. 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 yeah you, you may have, you, you know, it's always a trade off at this point in time mm. for short term gains, especially with bodybuilders, certain yes. athletes. Mm. For long-term health benefits, right. you know what, what what game are we playing here? Right. If you're an elite trying to work at a high uh, performance level, you know you want to be the New Zealand champion in whatever. Yes. Okay. You, maybe you, you need to make that. Difference. Maybe you need to make that difference. But right. if you are, you know, Joe Average. Yes. There's no reason. What are, what what are you trying to achieve? You yes. know, it's a good physique. Yeah. Then you know, is the extra centimeter of muscle gain? How, how much of a difference mm. really is that going to make in 10 years time? Yes. So then you had, it's sort of, would you say it's a lot of weighing up the risks? And then it is people, a lot of weighing up the risks. And everyone, would you say the general population is generally on the wrong side of the spectrum? They're generally having generally, way, too yes. high, way too high GI foods. And well, it's way too much processed crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it really is. If we can reduce the processed food, mm. it tends to even out a lot of the other things. So if you're prioritizing protein, especially if you're getting it from real food, not yes. just from protein shakes. Yes. Would, would, would you say there's an issue with protein shakes? Because people, for example, I can't see what makes, what makes 30 grams from whey protein different to 30 grams from a steak. Or, but I, I, I can see the difference between say, um, I'm not exactly sure what a good example would be, but... I, I, I sort of joke here and sort of come back to it alphabetically or categorically. Okay, when you're eating a steak, yes. what are you eating? All sorts of things, getting B vitamins, etc. Not just B vitamins, you're getting, um, depending on how rare you cook your steak, you're, you're getting um, blood, so you're getting iron, you're getting sodium, potassium. Yeah. Okay, you're eating a whole animal. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, you're also eating your organ meats. Okay, we should be eating nose to tail and looking at non-muscle meat proteins mm. because they're packed full of um, vitamins, minerals, and, and other things. Mm. Um, there's a big um, health kick around bone broth right. for its gelatin content, right. right? But you know, you can buy beef tendons from Pack and Save for $1.79 for about, I don't know, 400 grams tendons. or something. Beef tendons, yes. You cook them up really slowly and you get this... Um, <coughs> Gel- silky, gelatinous, um, it's a delicacy in some forms of oriental cooking. Right. Cooked well, they it tastes just, not that bad. It tastes not that bad. You know, is it any different really to rice noodles? Right. Right, you know, if you eat um, um, a slow cooked lamb shank, hmm. you know, how many people sort of go through and literally the only things they haven't eaten on their beautifully slow cooked lamb shank, the bone is left behind. Yes. But every other bit of edible um, 
thing is eaten, yes. which includes the gristle, the knuckles between the bones. Right. That's non-muscle meat protein. Right. Right, and that's full of gelatin, which is what people are going for when they're eating the bone broth. It's a case of, well, you know, you could just get some protein, extra protein in your gelatin. So we need to be looking at eating whole animal, nose to tail. That also comes down to um, improving the health of the environment because right. we're not then wasting half the animal. Yes. We waste so much food, yeah. but we're not getting some of the most nutrition bits out of do an we just animal. Ignore it's usually the organ mates. Because essentially we're being picky because we like the steak and we like the... But if you go back and look at, again, going back a thousand years, mm. But even if you go back to the uh, the Inuit, the um, a lot of the Arctic explorers, mm. they killed a seal. What's the first thing that was normally eaten? The liver. Mm. It was most nutrient dense. It was also uh, okay. This might sound a bit gross, and I don't recommend doing it in the modern context with food from the supermarket. <laughs> the um, the Inuit would often eat the liver fresh. Literally straight out of the animal at body temperature. Right. Very good source of vitamin C that way. Right. Right. Once you cook the liver, you've lost your vitamin C, but you have most of your other vitamins, minerals, nutrients, trace elements. Right. There in the so liver. That would be naturally what they would go for. Yeah. So it's just. It's nutrient dense. Right. Essential vitamins and minerals. Um, high protein, high iron, mm. high sodium, high mm. potassium. Mm. You know, right. it's and there's a lot of. Do you feel like that's a lot of, a lot of the issue is that we, we we swapped out things like that for everyone now, like even if you just look at pretty much anyone's diet, I think with the general public it's pretty shit overall. Well, I spend. It's one of those terrible things that you do once you start learning about diet. You spend a lot of time looking what other people put in their supermarket trolleys. Right. And it's a case of, um, and I'll often do my uh, supermarket shopping at Pack and Save in Lincoln Road. Right. Uh, it's a relatively low socio demographic area. Right. And people are putting in the white bread, the corn flakes, yes. the uh, biscuits, the potato crisps, yes. the, uh, the sodas. Mm. And yeah, they make your brain feel good. They'll light you up with dopamine. For like four hours or whatever. Well, yeah. for, for minutes. Yeah. Um, and so you can get a feel-good factor out of eating that. And if yes. you don't know any better, then then yes. But they're also they're quick. They're satiating. They're quick. They're easy. Yes. Right. They're cheap. Mm. It's harder to cook real food. Mm. Yeah. Oh, don't get me wrong. It is much harder to cook real food. Mm. And you need to be a lot more organised. I go to the supermarket way more often than I used to, mm. because um, when we renovated our kitchen after I'd learnt a lot of this stuff and passed it on to my husband. Mm. Uh, we bought a fridge that was about twice the size right. it used to be and have hardly anything in the pantry. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you know, tin tomatoes, um, oils, salt, peanut butter. He eats it, I don't. Um, but, you know, there's compared mm, to, yeah. I, you know, there's no pastas, there's no rices. There's, although I did find a really good mung bean pasta the other day. Right. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that. It was expensive, I have to admit. Right. Do you, would you say that is a primary issue for a lot of people? For example, his, because if you know Krispy Kreme, you know how it's it's made, there's oh only God. one, and it's yes. made exactly in Manukau, which is, to my knowledge. Yes, and I know people yeah. who, when it opened, decided they were going to go for a field trip from Whangaparoa to Manukau <laughs> in the middle of rush hour to go and get these donuts. Mm. And do you think, would you say, especially when you're, of low socioeconomic status, would you say there's a lot of barriers in your in your way? There's a lot of barriers from a, somebody who's a low socioeconomic status to eating healthy. Absolutely, right. Um, it is a lot of these people are time poor. Mm. You know, um, I have a slow cooker. Some days in the morning I'm organised mm. and I can chuck everything in the slow cooker before I leave in the morning and I come in the evening. It's, it's there. It's cooked. Yeah, but. You know, if you're, I'm, I don't have, I'm not living from paycheck to paycheck. Mm. I'm not stretching every cent down to the max when I'm going to the supermarket. Yes. So I can have the food it, there, it's there, it's easy, it's readily available for right. me. Right. I can, I can do that. But if you're working two jobs, trying to manage a family, mm. may not have basic cooking skills to know what to put in where. Yes. This now starts becoming very, very difficult. Mm. 
I, and you know, the, the investment in a slow cooker, fine, there might only be like $60 on sale at Briscoe's. Mm, but then you've got to actually get that $60. You've got to get that $60 together in the first place. Yes. So it's so so the barriers are significant. Mm. Plus, when you go out to when you go to a an area of Auckland that's lower socioeconomic, the amount of fast food places are high. Yeah. The amount of places where you can buy fresh fruit, vegetables, meat, fish mm. are low. Mm. So you've actually got to go out of your way in many cases to actually get to a place where you can buy these things. Mm. And then that, would you say that perpetual? That's a barrier in itself. Yeah. Then you've got the, as I said, you know, um, I mean, my nephew just sent me a photo of what he made in a technology class today, mm. pavlova. Right. They don't learn how to yeah. cook meals like we used to do <coughs> in, in the equivalent, home economics, equivalent yes. to technology. Um, not that I can remember making anything that exciting because it wasn't really compulsory for us. Yeah. But um, but they they're cooking with flour, sugar, mm. um, margarines because they are cheap. Yes. And they store well. Yes. So that the technology teachers aren't having to work out what's on special, what's not, what's you know yeah. not having a lot of it's things wasted. Easy. It's yeah. easy. So they yeah. You know, but they they don't have to come out learning how to cook meals. Yes. They have to be able to plan and execute mm. a recipe. And I think. But they're not learning fundamental skills. Mm. And in contrast, like my family, we're, we're well off, we're fine, we don't have to struggle. So if I want to learn how to cook something, I can usually go into the pantry and get it, or I can just go and buy it. Yep, and, and you've, you've probably yeah. also got access to uh, the internet. Exactly. YouTube, yeah. YouTube how, do I, how do I cook a steak? And you'll yeah. have a step-by-step -step recipe taking yes. you through it. And just a lot of people do not have access to those sorts of things. Right, so yes. it's, um, so, so then they can't even get the skills and can't even understand. They don't it even know becomes a, a self-perpetuating burden. Yes. So yeah, so it's um, there's a lot of work being done out south, a lot of places, mm. Manukau, Unitech, community gardens. People mm. learn how to cook. A lot of schools have got gardens going. Right. Right, and then and they um, Point Chef School um, does soup. They they learn how to make in the winter. Each class takes it in turn to make soup for the city mission. Right. So the kids are bringing in vegetables. Right. And they're learning how to cook them. Yes. Right. So they're not they necessarily actually... eating them. Yes. You know, it's going to city mission, but they mm. at least they are learning. Mm. So there needs to be more of that, in, in mm. my opinion. Would you say that? Because it makes me quite sad. I think just the general state of the general public in a lot of areas nowadays. It does. And the other thing that makes that I, I think is really sad is the um, uh, in a lot of places. Um, the islands and a lot of places overseas, mm. they're striving to be Western. Yes. All right, and to have Western prosperity. And one of the signs to show that you are becoming more prosperous is to drink fizzy drinks mm -hmm. or to be able to have the Krispy Kreme or the McDonald's in your community. And because you're eating from there, yeah. it's a sign that you've got, you can afford to do right. this. But it's, you know, it's almost... go home and eat the fish and the vegetables from the. Yeah, you know, the kaimoana that's, yeah. that's come from the sea and the vegetables mm -hmm. from your garden. Mm -hmm. It's much healthier for you. Yeah, much healthier. And it, it, it's, it's quite scary because when you obviously, I don't think I'm at the greatest risk of diabetes, but then you look at the general population and from to my knowledge, I believe the rate's just going up. The prevalence is going up dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, in America, the scary thing is, I think it is... Uh, Three quarters of Americans of all ethnicities over the age of 65 have got type 2 diabetes. Mm. Three quarters. Yeah, that's right? fucking scary. That is extremely scary and the mm. majority of those are type 2 diabetes. Yes. Having type 2 diabetes increases your risk of cancer, heart disease, amputations, blindness, mm. erectile mm. dysfunction, that's a very early symptom. Mm. Um, but also your dementias. Mm. The, what's scary is we've now got children mm. with type 2 diabetes. Mm. You know, you, you have a child diagnosed at the same age, one's got type 1 diabetes and one's got type 2 diabetes. The child with type 1 diabetes has probably got a much better long-term health outcome mm. compared to the child with type 2. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are going backwards as a society. Yes. 
It's and quite, it's, it's very, because even my mum, she got diagnosed with pre-diabetes a while ago. Yep. And then, I don't know if it was you or someone else who said, I think it was someone at my other lecture, like they both basically said, they, everyone they've seen ever with pre-diabetes has gone on to get type 2. Guess what? There is a study come out of the United States that say that we can, um, now there's a big debate as to whether we're going to call it remission, reversal, cure. Right. Right? But they're taking people with type 2 diabetes. There's several different dietary options mm. available, mm. but they're getting people off their medications. Yes. Right? They're getting their glucose levels back down to normal. Mm. Now, that's all being done with diet because mm. they're ditching the medications. Yeah. And there's, you know, surgery work, bariatric surgery can be successful. A low fat, calorie restricted diet can be successful. Mm. And an extremely low carbohydrate diet can be successful. Mm. So we can manage this with dietary means. Right. All right. So it's we used to think, and a lot of people still do think, that diabetes is a progressive disease. Mm. All you can do is slow it down. Mm. But at the end of the day, you're going to be on insulin. Right. But in this case, I'm going, no, the future's actually much yeah. brighter than that. Yes. But we've got to get this out. Mm. But more importantly, we need to be doing more on the prevention side of things. Yes. You know, um, the hospitals have all gone through and uh, you can't buy sugar um, soft drinks anymore. There's a small amount of pure fruit juice available and there's diet drinks available. Yes. But basically it's water and, okay, there's some flavoured waters. Yes. Um, much better options. In much better options. But the hospital is starting to go junk fruit free. Yeah. sugar soft drink free okay we can't stop what people bring in mm. but at least we're making environments better yeah. a whole lot of schools around are going water only schools mm. Mm. and they see that, and they're also doing a little bit of lunch box call it policing yes and I think sometimes they do go a little bit too far right but they're trying to make sure that children have got some quality protein yes some quality fat yes low glycemic load carbohydrates mm. rats are not low glycemic load generally but it's the amount that's there yes. at the same time. But they're doing that and they're finding that attention spans improve in the afternoon. Mm. So their education, the child's education is improving because the nutrition is improving. Mm. If the education improves because the nutrition is improving, they've got a better chance of getting a higher paid job, mm. which means that they can then improve things for the next cycle. Yes. And do you feel... Like, I, as you know, I, I'm studying podiatry and I quite like podiatry, but I'm not going to end up being a podiatrist because it's, it's like I'm going to do exercise science after so I can basically do something similar to Eric and to Eric Helms and do something similar to him and almost, almost treat the cause, not the, not the symptoms. And you want to prevent, yes. you know, that's what we're looking for, more people moving into prevention but mm. there's lots that people can do mm. you know if they're sort of going you know sort of start with you've got to start with yourself mm. and take a cold as I said and take a cold hard look at what you're eating and drinking do you feel like it needs to come with education though? because I feel like say five years ago if I looked at my diet I would have thought I was fine because I was like oh yeah you're skinny it's fine if there's a it's it's a it's an hourglass approach yes there needs to be a top-down approach with things like the DHBs are doing and saying sugar is bad for these mm. reasons. Yeah. But there also needs to be a groundswell bottom up approach. It's the peer pressure model or the mm. peer advocacy model. Yeah. You know, you've got one person who's going, um, I'm no longer going to have this. Um, you know, electrolyte drinks are often important post exercise. Mm. But, um, just then. but you don't necessarily need the high carbohydrate electrolyte drinks mm. and depending on how much exercise you've done you don't always need the electrolyte drinks yes. so you know kids sport water yeah maybe with half an orange yeah. you know let's go back to the half you know the oranges and water at half time sort of thing yeah but you get one group doing this mm. or, or one person doing this mm. and that can have a snowball effect and when that team starts doing really well the next team goes, oh, what are they doing that's yeah. making these gains? So it needs to be And then you get the parents going revolution. to get, it needs to be a social revolution. Yeah. So the social revolution has to happen at the same time as the governmental 
mandates. Mm. You know, and people talk about it being the nanny state. But as an example, I can talk about smoking. We all know that smoking is bad for you. Mm. We knew this in the 1960s. But it wasn't until the government started putting pressure on people in the 1980s. They, um, cricket used to be sponsored by Benson and Hedges. Rothmans used to sponsor all sorts of things. I'm assuming these are cigarette brands. Yes, these are. Yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's just it. Yeah. These were common brands for when I was growing up. Right, and they would just be household names. They were household names. Yes. The Marlboro Man, uh, cigarette <laughs> placements in movie theatres, you know, right. movies. Do you feel like they when that, the same thing with sugar or with Yes, so that shipping. changed and you started seeing less people taking up smoking because mm. it's no longer promoted. Yeah, now it's seen as very uncool. And very, only in some circles. <laughs> hopefully. It's, I think Sorry, in, in some circles, it's still unfortunately there. It's seen as the thing. Yeah. But you had all these people who were currently smoking. Mm. You had much fewer people starting smoking, mm. but you still had these people already smoking. Mm. When did they stop smoking? Sometime it was because when the woman got pregnant mm. and the family stopped, no secondhand smoke for the baby. Yeah. Right, that was a big trigger. Sometimes it was the kids coming home saying, um, Daddy, I don't want you to die. Yes. Because they'd learnt about smoking at school. Right. Right. These are people who've come in to see me as a pharmacist. These are, these are all real stories. Mm. But most of the time it was a case of, my workplace has banned smoking. Right. Right, I'm not allowed to smoke in the company car anymore. Yeah. I, I, I need some help here. I yeah. don't really want to give up smoking, but I need some help here. Mm. Many times that was a case of, we've increased the taxes. Yeah. I can't afford to smoke anymore. Yeah. But quitting smoking, basically it's free. Yeah. Right, you know, five dollars for a month's supply or a couple of months supply of your patches and things. Yeah. So the government put barriers in place. Mm. The social revolution said this is uncool. Mm. And we've increased the amount of barriers in place. A lot of people say, no, you can't smoke in my house. Yes. Those barriers go in place. And we're starting yes. to meet in the middle. And even generally within kids, like if you go to a party and you smoke, you'll still get hate. And it's like, if you see someone smoking at a party, you'll, 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 you, everyone won't be like, yo, that's so cool. Everyone will just say, go on, take that outside where we can't smell yeah, you. Yeah, no one's going to, if you do it inside, everyone's going to be like, what the fuck are you doing? And, and, and a lot of times, you know, the girls will be going, um, I can smell that you've just had a cigarette. Yes. Go away. Yeah, I yeah. don't want to know you. Yes, yeah, and exactly. I imagine the same thing will happen with the guys. But, mm, mm, um, mm, mm. you know, it, it's so the same thing actually needs to happen mm. with a lot of sugars. Now, I'm not saying... Yeah. It won't be... I think it'll be... Obviously, it won't happen overnight, but it's... It's not going to happen overnight. And I'm not saying all treats are bad. I mean, when I was growing yes. up as a kid, um, we got fish and chips on a Friday night, mm. partially because my sister and I used to work in this fish and chip shop. We were usually working on Friday night. We got free dinner. Mm. But once a week, we got fish and chips yep. and a 1.25 litre bottle of soft drink. Right. Not each. Between that was anyone. amongst whoever was at home between yes. three to seven, depending on whether friends were around, mm. depending on whether dad was home or not, because he mm. often worked away. Mm. But we had one glass of soft drink yeah. and as that was a, a that treat, was the treat. Yeah. once a week. Instead of... Instead one can of, every night or two cans or Well, I've got whatever. patients who think that a 1.25 litre bottle several times a day is a normal amount of soda to yeah, drink. Yeah, my brother, um, well, there was a long time where we actually had to wean him off um, Coca-Cola and it was it was a long period. Yes. And we've just, we've just finished. Yes. And it's like, that took so long. We, we went travelling once and we were like on a train and it was like really like, damn, I need some, I need some Coca-Cola, I need some caffeine, sugar, all of it and just... It is highly addictive. It is highly addictive. Mm. Yep. And that's the thing that people uh, people just say, I don't know what it was. It was th this was a lecture. It was a pharmacology lecture. It wasn't your lecture. It was one of the other lecturers. They said something, and obviously I'm not going to mention names. won't say anything, but they basically said because it's because the withdrawal symptoms aren't that big, it's not a real addiction. And I thought that was absolutely bullshit because I take like 500, 400 milligrams of caffeine a day. When I don't take caffeine, well, this is not not currently, but but whenever I withdrawal, I get headaches, I get all these things. Just because it's not crack doesn't mean it's not hard. Some people will take cocaine occasionally, mm. and it's not an issue. They might have a headache, they might have a bit of the grumps. Mm. I have worked with people. I have had, I still do to a degree. I'm probably always going to be battling it, a sugar addiction, mm. and me coming off sugar was not. 
I had physical symptoms. I don't know how much of that was the sugar and how much of that was um, keto flow. Right. Oh, I was unhappy. Mm. And for weeks afterwards, it was a case of I'm working in my pharmacy on a Friday night. Mm. Right, me, two staff. Mm. One of the girls came in with a biscuit, chocolate biscuit from the subway next door. Yeah. I loved these biscuits. I had to tell her to take it outside and eat it <laughs> because... It was just too tempting, it was, too it, it, you know, stressful. It was, it was too stressful mm, to mm. see this. I just wanted it. Yeah. So, no, um, I, I think some people say, oh, I gave up cigarettes and it wasn't an issue. Mm. But the average amount of times that people take me off cigarettes, somewhere between three and seven. Yeah. My dad was a heavy smoker. He mm. quit. Mm. He is one cigarette away from being a heavy smoker. Mm. This is 20 years down the track. Mm. He still says he is one cigarette away from being a heavy smoker again. Mm. So a lot is your personality and how addictive your personality is mm. as to how much this is. But no, sugar, starch, caffeine. Mm. Um, I've seen the, the range. I've seen the symptoms. Mm. If you say you're addicted, you're addicted. Mm. Okay? Um, mm. It doesn't have to be physical symptoms sometimes it's just seeing that biscuit yeah yeah no is that it's all it's going to take it to cause. take it, the amount of damage it yeah. can take yeah. and it goes through the exact same pathways in the brain right the dopamine yeah. lighting up cocaine causes dopamine to light up mm. methamphetamine causes dopamine to light up it does all these other things as well mm. caffeine noradrenaline and dopamine to light mm. up mm. if you're addicted to something it's a dopamine reward response yes sugar lights up the dopamine yeah so a lot depends on whether you're an addictive personality or yes. not yes and like same thing I think that people say with social media which I have a big issue with and I'm trying to cut down in general because it's it is very addictive and it's scary how much you'll be in a room with 10 kids or 10 people my age and even if we're out of a social function how they'll pull out their phone and obviously there's a lot of shunning it now because it's we know it's bad and people are starting to realize like it's not just people your age yeah like it's bad like okay, it can be really bad yes i do have a social media issue as well i'll agree mm, with mm, that mm. but once a year i try and get away for a week to 10 days mm. no electricity mm. no social mm. like no, no wi-fi i went to waiheke yesterday and i was just with my friend she's like my best friend and we basically our phones were in our bags the whole time and we didn't even think to get them out the whole yep. day and it was crazy and like yep. just at the end of the day i was like wow it just feels different yes it does and it was insane because what's happening there again i can bring it back to being a dopamine response mm. because you are having this amazing day mm. you are feeding your dopamine yes. with all of these wonderful experiences yes so you didn't need that dopamine somebody's liked my whatever, whatever yeah. Just even that scrolling. gives you a dopamine response. Yeah. When you don't, don't need get that, that well, when you when you put a post up and you don't get the response, it's kind of like gambling. It makes you want to double or nothing, put out something even better to get those responses. Yeah. So it starts. You have to work harder and harder. Maybe we all just need to sort of slow down. Mm. Screen before sleep is really bad for disturbing your sleep. Yes. That's big. And Wind down and and go out and. And work out how to trigger your dopamine in, in gentler ways, like mm. watching the toey feed off the flax flowers. Yeah. And Just do general. I think, in general, if, uh, people, and I'm not sure what time frame's okay because it's currently 2.04, but um, in general, I think overall, for pretty much everyone, I think a lot of people have gone away from. Well, I think in general, everyone's serotonin and dopamine addicted and they want it fast and easy and just for everything. And obviously, it's, and I think it's coming from so many sources and then I think that's making and for instance for me for a long time it was video games and like I've played when I was 16 I had spent nearly 10% of my life on one video game that's including sleeping everything hours it was 200 days what game was that was, shouldn't I ask it was RuneScape it was crazy it, okay. uh, it, it, was, it was basically a game you just was it, it a Dungeon it, and Dragons type, type yeah thing, effectively quests yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I mean to yes because, because they, they sucked you in with mm. going, you, you, you want a reward of some sort, you leveled up, whatever it yeah. was, it lights up the dopamine. Yeah. Now if we take this back again to evolutionary times, mm. take it back a thousand years, you didn't have all of these overwhelming stimuli. Mm. So the brain seeks out these moments, noradrenaline and dopamine especially, mm. the brain seeks them out. 
But when they're coming through thick and fast, we're rewiring our brains. We're expecting more and more dopamine. Mm. When we're not getting it from normal day-to-day life, we go out yeah. looking for it in other places, in mm. games, in food, in drugs. Mm. You know, and it's a case of, no, we need to sort of keep yeah. thinking back to evolutionary times. Mm. We need to go back at least a thousand years. Our brains are slow, it's fast to adapt in some respects, but in evolutionary terms, they're very slow to adapt. Mm. And if we go back just 200 years, that's just not long enough for our brains to adapt. Mm, mm. And I, th- I feel like we've been given all the stimulus, and this is like the main reason why, why I do this podcast and why I try to push side hustles, because genuinely, I think a lot of people go to uni, don't like their degree, and then they go to all these other things to make life interesting. And then, for instance, for me, I can have a conversation with someone that I've either messaged on the internet, met them in a lecture, all sorts of things, and my mind is blown. And I don't think many people get that from a lot of things nowadays. And like, I'll be, I don't think people have, I feel like people are losing their emotions and just becoming robots. And it's scaring me a lot. Well, it's really interesting when you trace that back um, somebody used to said actually um, about the the internet. People don't retain information anymore. People actually handwriting standards. My God, they're wrong with computers. <laughs> oh, seriously, marking your exams. It was like chicken scratching from time to time. I think I've seen seven year olds. You know, I'm, I'm looking at the handwriting and I'm going, this heck? is on par to what in my class when we were nine. <laughs> um, but what the, the point was is that. We don't need to remember anything anymore. We can just look it up. Yeah. We filter information, but we don't sit and process information. Mm. We don't sit and read a book. We watch the movie, yeah. but we don't process the information slowly and in depth. Mm. But somebody said that about books. They were unhappy about books because it meant that people didn't spend time talking to each other processing information right. they used to so you can go back right to I think it was Aristotle or Socrates <laughs> or, or whoever said that books were like too much yeah right. each way we go through but we need to come back we need to think we need to process we need to digest um, having information coming at us thick and fast all the time mm. it doesn't give the brain enough time to mm. um, to process I mean it's one of the things that I actually have to admit that I, I love about my, my job now as a lecturer. I've, I've been here now uh, two years, mm. but it was also part of the PhD process. As you could go and sit um, on, a, on a rock beside the sea mm. and ponder what you just read for the last day. Yeah. And you could spend a half a day, ideally not getting sunburned, um, pondering this information and trying mm. to make sense of it. Yes. And that was considered part of your day's work. Yes. Being able to process the information. Mm. So that's, we've got information coming at us thick and fast all the time. Mm. Sometimes we do just need to go and stop and go, what does this actually mean? Mm. And the benefits of doing that, it's not just that we're, because we slow the brain down, we can move away from, um, when our thoughts are in a, in a whirl, I'm bringing this back to hormones again, mm. it drives up the noradrenaline, which can drive up the cortisol. When you drive up the cortisol, that's our stress hormone. So our body's going, we're so stressed because our thoughts are going so fast, this is stressing out the body a bit. Yes. And the body goes into a stress response, which increases our insulin resistance increases our insulin levels, Mm. drives down the glucose levels, makes you want to reach for a chocolate bar, um, but can start kicking off ill health, and that's just from information coming through thick and fast. So you can stop, be mindful, sit and think, Mm. you know, the scholar's garden, listen to the birds, the Mm. the ripple of the water, and you can let your thoughts slow down, and you can sometimes start to problem solve, start putting bits of information together. But at the same time, your breathing slows down, your heart rate slows down, your adrenaline comes down, your cortisol can come down, mm. decreases your insulin resistance. Because insulin resistance is not just this chronic nasty thing. Right. All right. It's a normal physiological response to stress. Right. It's just that if it 
insulin resistance. So normal for insulin resistance to go up and down over the course of the day. Mm. It's just that when it goes up, <coughs> stays up, that's health problems. Yes. Yeah, that's an issue. So you stop, you think, your mind can slow down, you can mm. problem solve better at this point. Mm. Um, but your body slows down as well and it yeah. starts to helping to heal. Mm. But being able to sit down and stop and to think and slow down your thinking mm. can be as big a challenge for some people yes. as not eating the chocolate bar. Yes, because I think, like for me, what's made this podcast so valuable for me, I haven't earned a dollar from it yet and I haven't tried to monetize it yet, but if I, I get to sit down have basically no stimulus except the person I'm talking to and I can ask them whatever questions I want and then from there I'll, list, I'll re-listen to that conversation and edit it so it's like that it blows my mind because now I feel as though and I think this is one of the primary issues that I've realized, realized over the last 30 or 40 episodes it's like and something that I just that stresses me out a lot in general is I see kids a lot of the days I don't feel as though they have nuanced perspectives and they don't seem to have maybe this is just kids being young and not doing that but I see it in adults too that I don't think they've actually thought issues through to the point where they have their own opinion I would say for a lot of children yes um, but for in other times no but the way the, the children in whom I'm seeing a lot of nuanced responses my 10 year old niece completely blew me away the other week with some of her responses mm. um, she's a free range kid no, she climbs trees, mm. chases chickens. So, you know, uh, up until recently, she's been living on a chicken farm. Right. Still on the same farm, just not as many chickens anymore. <laughs> um, but they often have to think through action and consequences. Yes. We talk about um, helicopter parenting and lawnmower parenting, mm. which means that when parents are making all of the decisions, children don't get a chance to. Mm. You know, I would much rather children learn about gravity and consequences of hitting things when they're on a bicycle rather than behind the wheel of a car yes yes yeah you know, get children to go out and climb climb trees mm. you soon learn the consequences of <laughs> some of your actions and but then you get parents sort of going right let's think that through what happened how could that have gone better yes what do you think you would do next time round? Mm. and do you feel like well i sort of feel like it's 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 happening people aren't getting that sort of freedom or just uniqueness or doing whatever they please or they're just being drawn towards these things and it's a very young age now well it, it, to me it's a challenge because when you say you know that people aren't being able to do as they please it's a case where a lot of people are doing as they please and mm, they've got no respect for other people yes you know i'm going to ride my lime scooter down the middle of this <laughs> and i don't care who i bowl over because i'm allowed to yeah well, that's a case of, come on, let's think about the wider consequences yeah. of, of your actions and mm. what those actions are having on other people. Mm. So, but it's, it's being, giving people a chance to sort of stop and reflect on their actions. Yes. It's the reflection that comes through as the important part. These things, these high, <laughs> I guess, um, dopamine and serotonin, um, what is it? you know GI but in that that sense so it's you're getting a high amount of dopamine and, ser dopamine and serotonin from all these different stimuli do you feel like that's taking away from their reflection time it's not allowing for reflection mm. time it's um, because you're being stimulated stimulate and you don't have to think necessarily about your stimulation yes you just put it on and it's being bombarded at you yes this is why I am reluctant to get a car which is weird but basically when I ride the bus I I can do a little bit on my phone, that's cool, but if I just turn wi the Wi-Fi, the 3G off, I can listen to a podcast or sit there and think, and when walking, what do you do? You walk and you sit there and think. And I think everyone my age is like, no, I'm gonna get a car as soon as I can, make everything su super efficient. And I get that, time is important. But I pretty much have no choice right now but to ride the bus or walk or whatever. And I think that gives me that time where I genuinely have to think through through things or just be incredibly bored so what's the option I'm probably gonna think things through yeah yeah but other people will take the option of picking up their phone mm. and having some stimulus thrown at them to prevent the boredom yes. they don't know how to be bored mm. you know if, if you think about I can't remember the last time I was like oh what do I do or even just oh. I, I don't have something being thrown at me I don't 
when oh, I'm walking pick up a book, curl something. up on the beanbag, yeah, lie in the sun. Um, but, but people, but if you look at children in the cafe, mm. they haven't learned how to be bored a lot of the times. In this yeah. case, there are times you're just going to have to be bored. Mm. Um, was that a? Um, it was interesting. It was at a wedding many, many years ago, and it was a, an Indian wedding. Mm. And um, men sat on one side, the women sat on the other side. Right. Right. And I was sitting with a mum with her daughter, and same family, dad and son were on the other side. Right. And both ch- children of similar ages, getting restless. And mum, you know, mum just said to the daughter, "Look, look at the colours. Do this. Do that." You know, it's um, this is just what it is. You just have to sit and learn. To, you have to learn to sit and work at how to be bored, basically. <laughs> Keep your brain occupied while you are not understanding anything as to what's going on. Yeah. On the other side, dad had given son his phone. Yeah. But the daughter is going to learn up learning how to how to stay awake in a lecture when you are <laughs> really not interested in the topic. Yeah. But how to manage. Um, but that might give more reflection skills. I don't know. I mean, I'm not mm. a parent. Mm. Um, I don't know how to manage these things. Mm. All I'm seeing is we've got a society getting sicker and fatter mm. at a younger age. And just, I think, in general, more lazy and probably due to that... Um, but I would leptin. say that's due to leptin. Yes, yes, yes. Not due to... We, we put it down to you don't have any willpower. Yeah, in this case, if you're fighting your evolutionary leptin and your brain's being told it's yes, starving, I completely agree. That's not about willpower, fighting yes. the hormones. Because then it's like you're you're trying to fight an uphill battle when in reality that doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. And people always, especially when you've never got healthy and you've never gone from unhealthy to healthy, people can't understand the actual the legitimate repercussions. Like people, a lot of the time, say bodybuilding. Oh, it's just fucking bodybuilding. You just gain muscle. That's it. It's just a it's just an aesthetic thing. There's no, there's no actually usefulness of it apart from that. But it is. I genuinely think it's changed my life and many, many other people. Not just because I've gained muscle, but it's just I've genuinely made my lifestyle surrounded around health. Right. But one of the other things is in resistance training mm. and building weights, doing weights. I will do weights um, depending on the week, depending on how much is on, depending on. But I try and get into the gym a couple of times a week mm. to lift weights. Mm. I'm never going to enter a bodybuilding competition. I'm probably always going to be lifting pathetic weights compared to everybody else in the gym. But what it is doing, when you build the muscle mass, um, it's like building a bigger petrol engine in your car. Mm. So when you put the petrol in, it's got more spaces to go. Yeah. You actually improve your metabolic health mm. by building muscle. Yes. So everybody should be doing resistance training. Exactly. That's the thing. that. And it, like, especially with a, there's a lot of culture with, with women I find it's especially men aren't really scared of weights too much but I find a lot of women are scared of getting too big scared yeah. of X, Y and Z but yep. in reality if you stay the same weight and you start lifting what you just add that stimulus of weights you will get smaller weight will stay the exact same if calories are controlled and all that if, if, you, if your weight stays the exact same you start lifting weights you'll lose fat gain muscle be smaller in general but you will also um, raise your uh, resting metabolic rate. Mm. Now that's actually probably quite a key thing for a lot of people mm. because you're actually burning more calories at rest mm. and you also start teaching your body, depending on the rest of your hormonal status, how to better burn fat. So that means that uh, when it comes to Christmas or a birthday and you've decided to have that piece of cake or whatever, your body can actually <laughs> handle it ever yeah. so much better because mm. it's got more capacity more resilience yes. you've built that resilience in through the strength training mm. and it's just generally when I find just when you do anything I feel like it has so many benefits and it's just even even when it comes to grades like if you just look at it purely from that perspective my grades went way way up when I started lifting weights and I had less time but I just and I think there's a lot of things that went into that and you can't just put it down with the weights but just generally, I think my grades went up just because I could focus more. I think I wanted to work harder and maybe. You became more disciplined for yes. a variety of different reasons. But if we bring it back to sort of the food hormonal piece, mm. is you started lowering your insulin levels, mm. which meant that what happens is when you lower your insulin levels and burn fat better, mm. is, is a complete and utter myth out there that the brain needs at least 130 grams of glucose a day. Right. Maybe it does, but it doesn't mean to say that you have to eat 130 grams of glucose a day. Yes, because people... Your body will make 
with most of that, but the brain will run on fat, on ketones quite happily. Mm. Strength training will encourage your um, fat burning capacity, mm. so your brain is going to be able to concentrate better. Small fluctuations in glucose in the brain mm. lead to big fluctuations in your concentration span, mm. both at the high end of the scale and at the low end of the scale. Mm. Feeding the brain with fat means that you can focus better for longer. Mm. <coughs> One thing that I'd like to touch on, and it was actually my sister who brought this up, but I don't think she, I think she's misunderstanding the issue or was taught it wrong or something, but, and I'm not sure what, the actual, what I'm actually talking about, but the, she basically said, sorry Laura, if I'm just, you know, but, sorry if I'm butchering this, but she basically said that the ketogenic diet is unhealthy because ketones are toxic in some manner? I'm not oh sure. yeah, so God, what, okay. what is right. the deal with this? And what I'm is not... the deal there? Yes. Right, okay. Um, I'm guessing this is coming from somebody with a medical background. Yes, she's right. a biologist. She's a biologist, okay. And probably the lecturer who saw, told her this was a bio biologist. Right, okay, so there might be something specific down the biology concept, but especially in the test tube, but people are not test tubes, mm. right? So ketones are a fuel, right? Glucose, if you have it in too high amounts, is highly toxic. The wrong types of fats in too high amounts are highly toxic. So ketones in too high amounts, yes, can be highly toxic. Right. But we're talking about too high amounts. Yeah. When ketones are formed, they are acidic. Right? Ketones are mild acids. Yes. The body doesn't like the acid to be too high or too low in the body. Right? It has a problem with that. So it buffers the acids that are produced and the alkalines produced by different bodily process with um, um, carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, sodium bicarbonate. Hmm. So there's a buffering system to keep the acids nice and even. Right. Right. So when ketones are being produced, they are acids. Mm. If ketones are not being produced in too high amounts, the body will buffer the acids quite nice with the bicarbonate system. Right. Ketones run around the body being used as fuels. Right? That's what they're there for. Mm. And the system carries on as normal. This is a normal physiological process. Right. The, there's two main times when ketones will get too high. It's one is when people are eating exogenous ketones. They've got ketone esters from a can yeah. and they're plowing them into the body. Yeah. I still haven't worked out where these fit in a healthy human <laughs> or a human trying to maintain health. P possibly I, around athletic performance or something? Possibly around athletic performance. Possibly, but that's... It's just... Do I, like don't, it's, I don't consider that as a health yeah. moment. Do you feel like it's, it's effectively like the... Uh, it's similar to taking pure glucose. Similar to taking pure glucose, yeah. But we've got the acid piece in there. Right. Okay. There are some health benefits for some disease states. There's some benefits coming through for Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's disease. But we're talking people at the extreme end of the health sickness yes. system there. Yes. The other group of people where ketones go too high are in people with type 1 diabetes. Mm. Ketones are very easy to measure. Tiny blood sample. Yes. Measuring body acidity is very hard to measure. Right. Right. So people, when they've got type 1 diabetes, if their hormones get out of whack, mm. their ketones can start being produced in an uncontrolled manner. Right. Right. Now, people with type 1 diabetes, their hormones are out of whack from baseline because they do not produce insulin. Yes. Insulin stops ketones from being produced. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. If your ketones start getting too high, it can turn on the insulin, and then you've got a feedback loop that says turn off ketone production. <coughs> so in somebody who's healthy, it's very difficult to get high ketone levels mm. because there's always some insulin around in the body, turn off production. So would you say in an, even in a normal type, two, type 1 diabetic, if they're taking exogenous insulin, they're probably still fine? Not always, okay? So let's. So people with type 1 are on a constant balance, and something else might upset ketone production. It's not just the insulin. Yeah. But measuring ketones is a sign that things are not going well. Mm. And if they're going too high, do we need more insulin? 
Do we need fluids? Do we need right. something else going on? So measuring ketones is a sign that things are going going bad. Right. All right. Normally blood glucose has gone too high, mm. which is a marker for ketones going too high. Right. Now, if ketones go too high in somebody with type 1, they can go into an uncontrolled production. Wait, so wait, wait. Does, does insulin basically... I know it has a lot of mechanisms of action, but I should know this. But. <laughs> <laughs> we taught, I hope you I taught you that. <laughs> so, it, it, I know it drives... It basically decreases blood glucose. Yes. The same, the same blood keto, ketones. But it will also reduce blood ketone levels. It, yeah, stops, yeah. The, um, it stops ketogenesis. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So that wasn't something that I pushed on you in the class. It wasn't wasn't relevant yeah, really yeah. in class. Yeah, Far more important to learn that high insulin stops you from burning fat. Mm. Right? Weight loss, got to control the insulin. Mm. Right, but we're coming back to the ketones. So the ketones get out of controlled production. You've now got an acid out of control in the body. Yes. Which is to cannot, and if the body cannot buffer that, you now has an acidosis state. So is that ketoacidosis? That's ketoacidosis. Right. Right. We've got an acidosis associated with high levels of ketones. But an acidosis associated with high levels of lactic acid or other acidosis, acidotic processes within the body can't mm. make enough sodium bicarbonate to, you know, that can be a renal acidosis. Yes. When you've got the acidosis, the acidosis is the thing that kills you. Mm. Not the high ketone levels. Mm, mm. The high ketones, yeah, okay, sure, they are causing the acid, mm. but it's the fact that we cannot buffer things and we've got a hormone yeah. condition that's out of control. So, that is the thing that's going to be fatal. So, it's uh, not the ketones by themselves. Yes. The ketones are the easy thing to measure. Right. Would you say the reason that this is not a major issue in the majority of people? It's because they can control it, they can buffer it. Yes, they, and they make insulin. Right, so They've got feedback loops in place. But we conflate ketoacidosis. All ketones in people with type 1 diabetes are bad. Right, so we, we look at it in two, two black and white. And that, it's two black and white. They basically label keto as dangerous. So ketoacidosis is labeled, ketones in the blood are labeled as dangerous <laughs> because of what happens in people with type 1 diabetes. Yes. Do you feel and like there will be a few other groups around. Yes. But it's also... I know a number of people with type 1 diabetes hmm. who manage the type 1 diabetes very carefully and under strict medical control, I'll add hmm. that disclaimer in, yeah. with a keto diet. Hmm. Right? That, but they are slow, so closely monitoring their ketones, they start getting high, they're getting extra insulin in place. And they understand what's And they understand the, yeah. the education. is yeah. It's not something somebody can just do as a whim. <laughs> okay, it really is not. That, that will end really badly. Hmm. Right? But, so ketoacidosis, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. Right? It doesn't just affect people with type 1 diabetes. Mm. It's happened in type 2 diabetes on certain medications. There was a case of a lactating woman on a keto diet who had a gastroenteritis, vomiting, diarrhea, which kicked off ketoacidosis. Right. Right. So, but in an average healthy person, a ketogenic diet may or may not be necessary but it's unlikely to be bad from yes. a ketone perspective. It's unlikely to be bad or dangerous. I think the only thing, my only main critique of keto diet is not actually the, the theory behind it, it's just the application I think a lot of people get Frequently, wrong. Frequently it is applied very badly. Yes, and that's the thing, like, I have a few friends, I won't say names, and I, you know, they're, they're lovely people, they understand, a lot of them I think use the diet quite well, but, and I think this is just people with diets in general, they don't even, they won't even consider calories in the mix. They'll just say, oh, I'm just going to go keto. And, and it's like, you've taken, <laughs> yeah, you've, ta you've taken the stimulus of high carbohydrates where you want to eat, and then high fat, high protein, you're going to be less likely to want to overconsume. And then... Yeah, you've got to, you've got to, oh, the, the worst work. people in the world are the ones who've gone too high in fat but not low enough in the carbohydrate because it's too difficult to get that low in the carbohydrate <laughs> and they end up with the worst of both worlds and it can really screw up the hormones and there's, yeah. there's so many more hormones that I haven't even mentioned didn't even breathe in class about <laughs> those hormones because I felt I challenged you enough mm. um, but you can just really screw up your metabolism yes. if you're not doing it as a well formulated mm. one for example I won't say a name but my friend basically he's I guess you call him, he's not a bodybuilder, he's more, he lifts weights, does a lot of weightlifting, but um, does a lot of swimming and stuff as well. But then 
whenever he wants to get get lean, he will basically crash diet. I'm not sure if you know that term. Uh, yeah. uh, look, that term crash dieting has been around since the 60s. It's not just bodybuilding. <laughs> oh no, crash dieting has been around since way before the 60s. So basically he'll do that, but on a keto diet. It'll be like normal, his normal calories might be like 2,800, something like that. Then he'll go down to like 1,400. And it's like, that is when it's like, whoa, what are you doing? Yes, but when you look at that sort of situation, because... It's not keto's issue. Well, keto is not the issue. He's ended up with a keto diet because, let's face it, um, with any dietary system, be it um, low carbohydrate, low fat, um, you need to prioritize protein. Mm. Right. So you've got whatever grams per kilo lean body mass, whatever macro calculation that you're working out with, mm. that's going to give you X amount of calories. Mm. Then you need your essential fatty acids. Mm. Okay, that's kind of still non-negotiable. So you've got to mm. put some fats into the mix. Mm. Right. And that's your minimum amount of fats that you need. Yeah. The rest starts to become negotiable. Yes. What's the easiest thing to cut out is generally carbohydrate. Mm. So a lot of these crash diets are um, yeah, if, especially if it's a well formulated one with an adequate protein, <coughs> do end up being by default low carbohydrates. Yeah. Because it's the easiest thing to yeah, ditch. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of them are also still low fat, which mm. is one of the reasons why um, when, you, when you look at the options for people, whether it's going to be a calorie restricted low fat, calorie restricted low fat, if it's been done properly, it's still actually quite low carb. Mm. Um, you know, low carb, you're still able to prioritize your protein in here. Mm. So as um, Ben Beckman has said, you know, three mantras for, for a well-formulated low carbohydrate diet is uh, prioritize protein, uh, control, control the carbs down to whatever is your determined, mm. then fill up on fat. Mm-hmm. So then, but yeah. Overall though, when you look at what every well-formulated scientific diet has in common mm. comes back to what I said at the beginning. Right. They've ditched the crap. Yeah. We've come back to real meat, mm. real vegetables. Would you say pretty much any well-formulated diet is better than everyone's diet nowadays? The majority well, of people. Well, that's just diet. it. When you start going through, you know, the um, what's one of the latest ones that's been going on? The bit, sorry. The meatarian diet, where they just eat meat. Oh, the carnivore. No, yeah, uh, carnivore we'll put the park that one aside. Um, what was one of the more weird ones? Uh, there was the Subway diet. And there's been the Potato diet. But we'll stick with the Subway diet because that's what people can probably relate with slightly better. This guy was horribly overweight. Yes. Right, so we said, right, I'm going to eat Subway, especially the um, low-fat ones. That is all I am going to eat. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, he ate Subway. And he lost an amazing amount of weight on his Subway diet. Mm. Now, when you look at his diet beforehand, pizza, fish and chips, burgers, crap, high energy, low uh, nutrition value, Mm. any diet was going to work for him. (laughs) You know, the uh, eat well plate, a keto diet, Mm. a vegan diet, a probably a potato only diet. Yeah. Anything was going to work here compared to where you come from. Mm. So the problem that we have within the research is we don't have any good studies that are going to say compare a vegan diet with a carnivorous diet. Mm. Well formulated vegan compared to a well formulated carnivorous. Yes, because usually it's usually it's standard American diet. Yeah, and if you compare or a, not not that. a standard American diet, it will be the um, New Zealand Ministry of Health guidelines compared to a. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, and that's not generally necessarily that well formulated either. Right. So usually, but if you go from a but common one is also standard American diet compared to the whatever. Mm. The whatever is going to come in quids <laughs> in. And it's like you, then people infer from that and say this is the best diet because that's the that. best diet. Now yeah. there's a paper that came out very recently that was a very well controlled one, and it looked at um, low carb versus low fat, calorie controlled. Um, and there was a couple of other different diets in between and they had had a good run in periods that people had lost weight and had stabilized weight on a standard diet Mm. then they controlled them into different dietary regimes and what they found that people on the low carbohydrate regime ended up increasing their resting metabolic rate Mm. so they started losing even more weight even though the diets were calorie controlled so these people should not be losing weight right 
they either had to feed them more calories compared to the other diet or they lost weight. I haven't fully read the paper. Hmm. But it changed their metabolic rate. So effectively, it, it changed would be similar hormones. to how when someone gains muscle, and say they st- say weight stays the same, gain muscle, they're just they're going to be burning more calories yes. in general. Yes. Right. And that was just done through diet. Everything mm. else was controlled for. Mm. So not all diets are created equal, mm. but not everybody is going to do well on that diet. Some mm. people will do better on <coughs> other diets. So we have to stop looking at it as a one size fits all. Yes, 100%. You know, what's going to suit a bodybuilder yeah. It's not going to suit a semi sedentary university lecturer. It's yeah. not going to suit uh, somebody who is. Uh, it's got type 2 diabetes, but a stay-at-home mum. Yes. It's got to be tailored. And people need to understand. This is something that Eric Holmes taught me a lot, is especially in anything to do with science, nutrition, exercise, etc., it's all grey. There is no black and white. There is no black and white, mm. no. I would say the only thing that is black and white is ditch the crap. <laughs> Carbonated, refined, yeah, acid, processed. There's very process. little black and white. Yeah, that's, that's the only thing that... Everybody agrees on that. Yes. There's a lot of things where it's like, Everyone's like, yep, you should probably do that. and But it's still like, why would keto be better than high carb? Or why would that be that? It's all context dependent. And it's all context dependent. Like for me, I don't, think, I don't think I'll ever be on a keto diet for the most part because it's just, it doesn't fit my context. It's just, I don't think, it's just not works for me. But then, for example, one of my friends, she's on a, she's trying to lose weight and she struggles with, eating a lot of carbohydrates, she eats, she eats a ton of carbohydrates, and now she's gone keto and she's just losing a ton of weight, finding it really easy to adhere she's, to. She's got her hormones under control. Exactly. Her hormones were out of whack with the carbs, Yeah, I'm guessing, but yeah. it's probably it's a, a reasonable guess, assumption. Yeah. Um, and now she's got the carbs out of the mix, her hormones can restabilize, and she's resetting her new set weight. Mm, mm, yeah, because her mm. body can now burn the fat. Mm, mm. And there will come a time when the weight loss will start to slow down or she'll start eating a little bit more because yeah. she's... You know, has stopped burning all the internal fat. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something that I think it's it's quite great once you understand that. And not, not even just for diets, just for so many things. And it goes back to the whole nuanced perspective things. It's like as someone will come to me and they'll say, "Oh, you're doing this wrong." And I'll be like, "Wait a minute. What about my context, though?" And it and I, again, people get stuck in the trap of saying it depends and yep. not giving further further explanation, but. Truly, it does depend, and yeah, then you should con- try Context is critical. I'm yes. all forever saying, well, um, somebody asked me a question. My answer is, well, it's kind of yes and no, which is, can be really <laughs> frustrating, but, but it's a case of what context are we looking at yes. here? Yeah, it's, um, and that's yes. the thing. It's so Everything is so complicated, and yes. I don't think I'll ever get to the point where I'm like, yep, I fully understand everything completely. And it's like, it's just, you're never going to get to that point where you're like, yep, no, there's nothing more to learn. Well, the scary thing is, is I'm scarily considerable on the world leaders in my field, mm. which I'm still getting my head around. <laughs> but it scares me to think that because uh, there's so much I don't know about all yes, of this. There's still that black hole that needs to be filled. There's so much of a big black hole yeah. and it's a case of, yes, I know a lot more than so many people. Mm. I'll, I'll accept that. But mm. there's so much that we that I don't mm. know. And mm. There's so many more questions. And there's so many questions that may, maybe can't even be answered by research. Like that's well, we thing. have to wait a lot of times for technology yes. to catch up with us, to mm. be able to take the thought processes further. Mm. So for now, it's still a case of sitting on a rock by the beach, pondering <laughs> what needs to be what needs to be done. Yeah. I think that's quite a scary thing. I'll finish off with one more question. What? So I've asked a few people this question, and mostly I've gotten a pretty similar answer. Um, so when it comes to calories in calories out and i'll explain what i mean by calories out calories out meaning the the calories not the calories my fitness pal says like the actual calories you're eating and then the actual calories you're genuinely burning would you say that is and for losing weight or gaining weight obviously the i agree that the ratios of fat to muscle may be different three different diets as that study said would you say that is always true if calories are the same or when i think you touched on this in your lecture when and what situations would you say that is not true? Oh God. Okay. How long do we have? Right. So, it's not just about the calories. What are the calories doing to the hormones? Right. Yeah. Right. Have the calories made the hormones want to partition the energy into fat to be stored? Have mm. the calories triggered off 
a, um, a cascade of hormonal events that's going to stop leptin from going to the brain, that's going to make you want to sit on the couch. Mm. When you nut it down to its purest base, everything else being equal, mm. if you eat more calories than you burn, you'll gain weight. Mm. If you eat fewer calories than you burn, you will lose weight. Yeah. The problem is it's not that simple. Yes. You know, when we talk about calories, I mean, if, we, like if, we, if we talked about macronutrients, when we talk about, you know, you could make a, um, a food supplement replacement from, um, you know, soy protein isolate and sunflower oils and whatever, whatever, whatever. You could get the exactly same caloric breakdown, vitamin mineral breakdown from real food. Which is going to satisfy you for longer? Which is going to um, <coughs> change things? They know now that high amounts of omega-6 oils increases your risk of sunburn, which increases your inflammatory processes, which kicks off other systems within the body. Mm. So it's a case of, is it, when it comes down to calories in and calories out, it's important as to look at the whole system yes. And how your system, which is in a constant state of flux, yes. is being changed mm. by what calories you're putting in yes. compared to what is being burnt and how mm. the influences happen <coughs> in the middle. For example, how, how um, generally exercising more and eating a better, whatever we call that, better diet will make you do more in general. Sort of thing. And yeah, if, you, if, if yeah, you can get yeah. your insulin down, burn more leptin, it's yeah. going to make you want to do not just exercise but also non exercise uh, activity thermogenesis. Yeah. So you've got the same amount of calories coming in just from a slightly different place, yeah. but it has made you burn more. Yeah. So people then sit there and go, but we've burnt more. So of course it's all about calories in, calories out. Mm. But the calories that you've put in, mm have manipulated your body yes. to influence your calories out. Yes. But if you... So do you think people only... they It's not... You cannot actually go by what my fitness pal says or whatever. Maybe it's a decent guide, but... Look, it's a... It's a start. Yes. You know, it's a case of... If you've had a week of doing this, mm. all things being equal, and not even weights, but look at your tape measure... Yes, yes. And that has made a change. Maybe your weight has made a slight difference. Yes. Well, keep going. See if that trend continues. Yes. If it's not, try something else. Yes. But yes. you know, it's um, set a target, measure it. Mm. Um, I'm I'm not saying don't use the, the the apps, the trackers, the everything else's. Yeah. If you can do more, same calories, but you're now doing more exercise, then generally that means things are going well. As yes. long as your sleep's going well, your exhaustion levels are going well. You're still, you know, you're not coming home from your run and just collapsing on the couch watching Netflix eating yeah. stuff, that's going to take you backwards. Yes. And I think that's the thing is if the, if the statement calories in, calories out um, predicts weight loss, I guess that's a good statement. Um, if that statement is true, the thing is you cannot blindly follow that statement because it's like this. We so are not bomb calorimeters. What do you mean by that? Oh, a bomb calorimeter is the um, chamber right, right, right. where you, you can measure. put a calorie in and measure how much heat it gives right. off so you can measure energy in and energy yeah. out. We are, we're humans. We are not bomb calorimeters. There's so many factors. We are not a closed, would like to think we're a closed system. <laughs> we are not a yeah, closed yeah. system. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think controlling the calories you eat is probably a good idea and understanding how many you're generally eating, but then... But you also have to factor changes. in sunlight, sleep, yes. stress. All of those things mm. factor into what your body's going to do to those calories. Mm. It's too simplistic just to say it's calories in, calories out. Yes. So in, in, in essence, the statement is kind of true, but... There's so many caveats, yeah. you may as well... <laughs> you may as well say... But at the same time, though, I've seen people on a keto diet who've gone, I've gone keto... But when you look at their bulletproof coffees four times a day and the mm. amount of fat that they're pouring over everything, they start wondering why they gained weight. Yeah. And it's a case, I thought this keto thing was supposed to help me lose weight. In this case, it calories does. still it, count. Yeah, that's the thing. Calories still count, but you've got to put it into the overall context. Mm. And that's the thing, I think it's, it's, with a lot of people with diets, I feel like there genuinely kind of has to be some education and it's, you cannot just be given, go do that. 
no matter how good it is, if you don't understand what's going on, yep. then there's an issue. You've got to have some education. Yes. But at the same time, we can't wait necessarily for governments to give us education. Mm. We can't wait for people to come to consensus on education. You've got to look at the information out there and make up your minds for yourself. Yes. So it's the sit on the rock and ponder in the sunlight <laughs> what is the best option for yes. me. Or even listen to a podcast about the topic and try and formulate your own opinion. Or you and then go and sit in the yeah. rock and digest your podcast. Yes, so yes. understand the context. Yes. And I think there's... With, with diet, it's still so complicated. And I it think it will be for the Utterly. next 50 years. But when we get to a point where it's going in the right direction, that'll be that'll be great. Because now it's obviously going in the wrong direction in so many ways. And yeah, it's very scary. But it's good that there's people like yourself that are educating people and sort of filling in that void and making it so people aren't so just lost. <laughs> like, I think there's some pretty general, generally good guidelines nowadays, but... Even when you look on like Instagram fitness, obviously it's a extremely short way to digest content, but um, it's like you get given, there'll be a picture with a quote saying, this is true, and then a lot of the time it's kind of true, but not really. You've got and, to not believe most of what you hear, and you have mm. to go and make it your minds for yourself. Mm. But the other thing I would say is there's a lot of citizen scientists out there. <laughs> who are doing a very good job. Don't write them all mm, off. Mm, mm. And that's the thing, I think, like even, even someone like myself, I have no nutritional form, formal background, apart from if there's any nutritional content contained in the lectures. And, but I still think I could give someone a relatively good guide of where to go. And it wouldn't be a, it would be probably be better than what, what they're doing. And if you compare that's just it. Generally, yeah. if we can do better than what we, what they have been doing, yes. you shouldn't be sending somebody backwards. Yes. Right. A caveat, the generally healthy person. Yes. If you've got somebody who's already slightly unhealthy, you've got to be so careful about working yes. with them. There's many issues to do with that. Yes. So, yeah. I think we'll, we'll finish it there. So, where can people find you online? Where can people find your email? Or any, any way that you want people to contact you? If you have a website, if you have... I've got a website that I don't use particularly often, um, pharmacistcatherine.net. Um, I'm on Twitter. It's either Pharmacist Catherine or Pharmacist Cat, something like that. Same for Facebook. Uh, so it can be found, but also just, um, I can, you know, just Google me. No, no problems. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Student Side Hustle. I would appreciate so much if you would leave a review. If you'd like to hear more of what I'm saying, then I would love if you would follow me on Instagram or check out my other social media all linked in the show notes. And again, I would just like to say thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful evening and study hard. <laughs>